Chase Dover. We saw him back out there with the tight ends with you today. I know you would talk after the Rose Bowl about how it was really important to have him focus on one position. Do you feel comfortable now that tight end is the right spot for him and that's where he's going to stay? I think that would it, a lot be with him too now. Like I believe that um, to, say, to say someone's doing something that's best for the team, it doesn't work. It's got to be best for the guy. So if Kay thinks it's best for him to be there, I definitely think he has the skills to be very, very good. I think he's pushing 258, 60 pounds. He's going to have a blocking presence. Uh, he had a phenomenal winner. I grew a lot of respect for him. I probably have more respect for him after he went to defense, the way he played defense, the way he worked out in the winter, because he became truly one of the premier top leaders of this team, the way he approached our workout and all that. So my thought if he came back was I wasn't going to tie his hands. I was going to try to get him to play with the energy and the passion that he likes playing defense. we got to play under control. We can't be reckless, and we have to have some fundamentals per se. But i like for him to, to play to his strength. So today, you know, it's just – he kind of came back just to give it a go here a little bit. We'll see how it's going. He's doing good at backer, too. There's a bunch of linebackers. So I think, uh, you know, he's trying to maybe see, how, you know, uh, to me, if he just trusts his heart and that's where his heart takes him, I think he'll be good at it. If his heart leads him to be on defense, I would I would say he needs to stay there. So I didn't ask him to come back. or Coach Day didn't ask him to come back. He's the guy that said, hey, as we're going through this, let me, can, can I give it a shot? Let's see. So, you know, that's where we're at. They had a, they had a good day. It looks decent. He'll be okay, but we'll see. Time will tell. Just not trying to force it. Didn't you know? We only put him over there in the in the bowl practice because we were down on numbers. But he had a ball. He had fun. He wanted to go with it. We allowed him to. You know, Coach Day's going to. We're going to have some guidelines, and we're going to give our guys some directions. But I think Coach Day believes that you know you give the players a chance to to make sure it's good within their heart, within their soul, what they're trying to do. So it was Kate's choice to be with us today, and he looked okay. I, I, personally like to have him back, but it's not about me. It's about you know me doing my job with the guys. So if he's with me, I'm all in, and we'll just see in the weeks to go and months to go where it plays out. I do agree, though, he does need to go back and forth all the time. But. I know. You know, Joe Royer, G. Scott, are a couple guys you're looking forward to step up in that spot just so far this spring. What have you seen? They've been really good. Matter of fact, I told them after the first week and then after last week, I don't need them to do better, but I need them to keep doing what they're doing. Just keep give me another day because if you keep stacking up good days, you know, we're basically playing tackle. We're basically playing receiver, so we're doing a lot of jobs. If you just keep having a good day, you'll get more competent. You'll get more confidence, and your role is going to grow. So they've started good. They're still, you know, around the, you know, uh, G's probably between 233 to 235 most days. Joe's around 239 to 242. Still like to find five, eight pounds a piece as we keep moving, keep developing. But they're developing nicely. They're making some good plays in the, in the pass game. They're better in the blocking game. Kate gives us a little bigger presence on the edge. So sometimes then it's just the matchups that Coach Day and myself or Coach Fry put them in as we develop run game and protections because it's one thing to do a job. It's, it's a little bit about the matchups. So it's kind of how we get those guys matched up. But I like Joe and I like G and the way they've started. And my prayers that they just continue to just keep doing it and good things are going to happen for them and good things are going to happen for us. To me, it's, it's, it's only good when you look back at the end. And I've always said from an offensive perspective, you can only do what the quarterback can handle and you can only do what the line can block. So you know the quarterback has a chance. It looks like he's proven he can handle a lot, but now as you're evolving with new line, okay, where, where are their strengths and weaknesses? So I think as the line and as the tight ends with Jeremy going, is that tight end room that we were talking about a minute ago with Dan, as, we, as that group complements the line, that will determine really what other skill guys can do. Because if you can't block it, you, know, you can't run it. You can't throw it. So some great skill pieces. I think what has a chance to be a tremendous line and and, uh, tr and a solid tight end group. But that those are those are groups only good with consistency. You know, a guy comes out and kicks a 58-yard field goal. You carry him off the field. You guys have posters of him. He's, you know, he made one play. You know, those those linemen. It's every day. It's every day. It's Tuesday. It's Wednesday. And every day it's going out there good on good. And you keep building that. And if we have a chance to be like you say stacked. Well, that line will keep stacking those good days and those tight ends stack those good days, and that will give us the balance and the consistency to be an elite team. So it's stacked with skill, 
but we got to make sure we stack it with consistent upfront play to be a great team. CJ, obviously an amazing year last year. Now he goes into a, a full spring as the starting quarterback. How much can he grow, and, and how much has he grown so far in spring? The thing I think with CJ is he still hasn't played a lot. He's played so well, and he's naturally, to me, extremely smart and visually sees things so well. Things I think that are hard to coach. But sometimes when you're that good at that early, it's the ability of the coaches to make sure they don't get bored. You know, that they keep, you know, it's, it's, you know, every day, you know, Tiger would be out there with the sticks and getting the alignment right the first thing you learn in the first lesson. So as advanced as he gets, that he stays with his fundamentals and he keeps the main thing, the main thing, and just, you know, keeps his feet and keeps trusting his coaches, keeps trusting, you know, what Coach Day, and Coach Dennis, and the Coach Fitch helps him out as well, what those guys are, that, he, you know, he believes in that, embraces that. And, you know, sometimes you get a lot of notoriety. It's hard to, quote, just keep your feet on the ground and stay, stay grounded. He is a tremendous kid, though. And he'll keep working. If he keeps working, the great players, to me, I, again, I go back and the few times I had a chance to see a, kid like, a guy like Drew Brees have a walk through, it blew me away, a veteran player, how, how well they did things. So when these young, talented players have such great success, get hyped up, the great ones have a way of staying centered, staying grounded, keeping it simple, listening to their coaches, being great team leaders. He's off to a great start. I think he's got a much higher ceiling than you've seen. I think he's unbelievably good. And there's a high ceiling for him to be a special player. Kevin, other than that brief cameo for Kane, I mean, you've been working with him for a while. If he stays with that tight end unit, what do you see as the ceiling for him? Can he become the, you know, you've got guys that have flexed out, you guys, Mitch played in the backfield. Can Cade do the all-around thing, or what do you see him doing best if he stays at tight end? Well, I mean, you know, the blocking piece, you know, he's a little bit, a little bit bigger than some of those guys in the blocking piece, but to be good, you know, you need to do it all. And to be good, what, we're, what we'd like to do in time, we did a little bit better last year, I thought, with, with, with Mitch, was when Mitch was in, we played the strengths that fit him. And in time, we can, if we get some consistency with Cade and then with G and then with Joe, we can play to their consistency. They are going to have to block. What are those blocking matchups? What's the structure of the defense? And then to be good, as good as the receivers are, we still need to find ways to get them on the field and work them in the progression. But they have to earn the right, as Coach Day would say, to command the ball. you got to be out there every day and, and show CJ you're going to separate and get open. If not, it's going to somewhere else. Or if not, we put somewhere else, someone else in, the, in, that, in that deal. So I see Mitch in time being that 21, a little bit of tight end, but a little bit of a fullback moving around guy. I see Kate being a, a tight end that, that we'll see where the passing grows, which I think could grow high. I really like the way Joe and G were coming that are the little bit more athletic I can catch, but are coming in the blocking. G probably doing as well as any of those guys with block fundamentals. It's just getting stronger and consistency with that. So in a perfect world, you know, you put them on the field, and if they go big, we spread them out, and you got guys that can get open. And if they go little, we got some bigger bodies, and you control the, the line of scrimmage and help the line. It's kind of like a basketball. The, to me, the tight end group's like a basketball unit. And it'd be nice if they were all 6'5", six, 6'6", six, six, and 260 or 70 and ran 4'4". Four, four. But they're not. Typically, some guys block better. Some guys run route better, run, run routes better. But when those guys get going and you put them on the field and you can move those parts around and you can take advantage of matchups, and that's what we're looking for, whether it be a blocking matchup or a route matchup, and that's where, to me, that group can grow and enhance our 11. Right now we're in 11. It's hard not to get a Mecca up there. and It's hard not to get Jackson and, and what we're getting with Marvin and the Julian and the young guys. So there's going to be a lot of 11. But when 12 goes on the field, it needs to be a 12 that can go big enough to match you and still spread you out and make plays based on how you want to match up with us. So it's like playing basketball. They pack it in, you got to hit some threes. When they spread it out, you got to attack the post. It's the same kind of deal to me at tight end. Who do you think Cade compares to that you've worked with at that position before? Interesting. I think he's going to be a little bit more skilled. But my, the one young man I thought years ago at Oklahoma, Brody Elwood, is one of my favorite players. A tremendous blocker, could lock you down. And he was a fourth round pick for the Colts and played a handful of years. Was a he's got a little bit of that defensive. I mean, because Brody was a DN. You know, there was a high school running back from a small rural town. So grew up on a farm. You know, uh, drove a truck. You know, uh, wore white T-shirts a lot. You know, I mean, he's a, you know. Very, very, I, 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 but Kay's not as good a blocker as that kid is yet, but I'd like to see him be that. And I think he could be a better route runner, more complete than Brody. That's a high standard for me. But I'm chasing him to be there. 
Kevin, you mentioned uh, CJ's vision and being able to see it. Obviously, you guys coach him up, he gets in the film room, but how much is a trait like that, some of it is innate, or how much can that just be learned to be able to see the field? You know, I think the more you do it, you can some degree learn it, but I think that guy played center and guard. I've coached quarterbacks before. I stand right behind him, and I have no idea who's open because I don't see that. I see that three technique getting ready to slant. I see this twist getting ready to happen. I see that linebacker bump, and I see the safety rotating down. But when they start going like this and like this, the ability to see spaces, some guys are very gifted at that. They naturally see it, and they keep their eyes downfield. And they have the ability to anticipate and see spaces. And it's, it, I guess through time, it's a little bit learned. And with trial and error and reps, you get better and better and better at it. And I think he had some good training. But, I, it, it, I mean, when I was a young coach, I had a, a friend of mine now coaching in the NFL, having a great career. And he was complaining. I said, come back in. You tell me who's open. Because I don't have a clue. And I'm standing right here knowing the play. I don't know which one's open. I, I don't see that. But those quarterbacks do. Some guys can see it. Some guys can't. You can work to improve it. As a coach, you try very, very hard to put them in as many situations as you can. But I think sometimes there is a gift that guys have it. And, and again, I, I, it's hard. I, I maybe had asked that question to Coach Day, who played the position, because me not having played it, I really don't see that. But, you know, I know Coach Day standing on the sideline can see the game as a quarterback. You know, I see it through the lines of alignment. Everybody sees the game a little bit different, differently. Offensive views, defensive views, like Coach Noel has. Great view and completely different than mine. We all have different views. CJ's got that view of a quarterback, and he has a unique gift of seeing it. And whether he's learned it or – Maybe a little. I think a lot of it's innately God-given. I know you guys make a game plan that brings out the strengths of your quarterback and your entire offense. If you have a quarterback that you know has that skill, that can see it, do, do you have to call the game a little bit differently if you have to maybe help a quarterback see it, a guy who doesn't have that as much versus a guy that you think, hey, CJ's going to be able to identify what's going on? Yeah, I, th I think you just get hesitant when you're not sure what he's seeing. And one of the best ways, uh, and I, I, I would be certain that m most of our coaches would tell you, one of the best ways you know when if a guy sees you, you just ask him what he sees. Because when I'm watching tape right now, I'm watching with the tight ends, I'm running it back 20 times. I've got about, I've watched it like the day before, and I'm sitting there for three minutes talking about a play. But you got about 2.2 second, 2.1 second to see. What did you see? And I don't know what you saw. And you saw it from here. We're showing you film from up here. That's nice. Uh, years ago, we used to have the quarterback stand behind and do plays, and Sam Bradford would get mad at me and say, you know, I'm standing deeper. It doesn't even look like that, Coach. I really don't want to do this. He was kind of mad about it. Like, well, I want you guys to give mental reps. He goes, yeah, but, Coach, I'm 10 yards behind where I'm really standing. That's not even the view I see. I see it from up in there. And so I just think if you, you try to enhance the guy, but when you, you put him in the drills and you ask him what you're seeing and you hope they give you feedback. I saw the linebacker do this. And as a coach, you just remember that. When you go to that tape, you, that linebacker better have done that. Because when that linebacker doesn't do that, you know he doesn't know what he's seeing. He's making up. He's, he's, you know, and when that happens, you get hesitant to call things. You try to call simpler things because you're not sure what he's seeing. The more you know that you can trust what the quarterback sees, the more aggressive and the more assertive you are as a play caller. Kevin, um, I don't know how much you've kind of matched with, with, with Jim Knowles yet because you're probably working more, more on fundamentals for your own units. But what are your impressions of, of just what he has brought to the defense and uh, the changes he's made? Well, I, I think, you know, we're still, you know, adding or to say change, like what is, you know, they're still putting in packages or things that are in. But what, to me, I, I think uh, he's done it long enough that he's got things that he believes in. And not only has things that he believes in, but I think they're packaged in a way that he knows how to implement the package and how to give his players a chance to then have confidence and see what's going to happen. He, they're doing a great job of multiple front or movement or alignments or coverages. So basically every play as an offensive line, as an offensive skill player, as a quarterback, they're making you mentally work. But the way it's put in, it's structurally sound. It's reasonably cap sound, and they're still making, I'm sure you'd say, a boatload of mistakes. Guys aren't lined up right, not hitting everything perfectly, but the structure appears to me to have a chance to be very sound, but at the same time making the offense work very, very hard. And, you know, the more the quarterback has to work and the more the offensive line has to work to do their job, the harder the game. And they're, they're, they're making our catch work. And then he's doing it with some really good players up front where a lot of those guys are back. You know, we're our, our two deep. And 
sometimes even our threes on defense run around like ones and one and a half. So, I mean, there's some, there's some good-looking kids over there running around. But I think he's you know, done it long enough. He knows what he believes in. He knows how to present it. I think he's presenting in a way that's building confidence. I think he's putting his guys in very, very good positions on the field. And they're feeding off of that. And they're starting out. We've got a long way to go. It's six days of practice. We've got summer and preseason and a boatload of games to play, we hope. But, uh, you know, as we go, I just, I, to me, not a long time. I like the way it looks. He's presenting a lot of challenges for us, which I think is awesome because every week we get worked hard with people trying to stop things that we do with, no one plays static football, and but they're playing. To me, they're. Uh, he has a great understanding of what he believes in, and I think he has a great. And it appears I've not said in his meetings, but I think he has a great way of capturing his room and his players and the way he implements. And and then with that, I think he's showing them feedback, the things I like, the things I don't like. This is great. Do it again. So I think he's building confidence. Hey, these are errors. Let's minimize that. This again. Keep talking with them. But I mean, it's been. Uh, it's, it's been a lot of good work going against them. I mean, they're making us work, which is fun. I mean, it's challenging the coaches, which is a coach is what you like. We're not, they're making us work to find, hey, what, 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 what are we blocking here? Who are we blocking? How are we identifying? What's the coverage? Where's the ball going? What do we like? It's been really, it's been very challenging. It's been very, very good. It's been a, it's been a very competitive. We, we've had to work on offense to have our share of success when we've had it. It has not been easy. We have had to work. Just what's he like in the room? Uh, you know, they, we split apart. You know, it doesn't say much in, in this, you know, it's that unless asked, but he's got, he's got a great dry sense of humor, it appears. And, you know, very, I think very intelligent and very smart guy, but like, he's got a great defensive view. And he's done it long enough. I think he knows the things he believes in. I think he understands how the, the issues, how to present issues to the quarterback and offense and offensive line, and at the same time, how to be sound and aggressive. And they're getting after it. He's, you know, he's had a long time. He's, he's, He's a great coach. No, I hadn't got there yet. It's been it's been 30 degrees, and I, you know, they did they did open my golf course Friday, and it's been 30 degrees every day since then. It's like killing me. Yeah, I didn't know that. You'll land us the athletic. Kevin, to run the ball the way you all want to run the ball, do you have to have a tight end on the field at all times, or can you accomplish some of that if you were to play four receivers in the back or three receivers? I, I think it's easier if you do. I think if you don't have a tight end that's really good, you get forced in. The quarterback has to be a part of reading or the arm because the box is all, can always get loaded. When the tight end's there, the box is going to get loaded, but it's loaded one gap wider. So there's just some more runs. So you can do some spread, spread runs, but when the tight end's not involved, you get into a lot of quarterback heavy run game where now he's got to be reading an extra defender whether it be in the, in the zone read or edge game or the quarterback bash and power read games, or then you get into the RPO game. So to hand it off sometimes when you have one or two tight ends, you widen the edges and you get a chance to get an A or a B gap run that doesn't have to be read all the time. And even practice sometimes, Coach today would kind of look say, hey, man, make sure when you script these plays, like I don't want a relief throw. I want to run it in Sometimes when you want to run it, you, you need to have that tight end presence. Or a six offensive lineman. Because and even you could put an offensive tackle down there and say, well, he's not going to run a route. Well, they still have to now cover the D gap because you have an A gap, a center guard's A, B, C. And when you put a tight end down there, you have a D, you, you widen things three, four, five feet, whether you run to him or away from him, if that makes sense. So you can, even if it needed to be an, an offensive lineman there, you can say, well, he's never going to run a route, but then they still have to cover down on that person. And that being said, to me, it just – you can run the ball better. That's why in the NFL you don't see a lot of the spread run stuff because the quarterback's either got to run it or throw it all the time. It seems like you'll have a pretty nice group of receivers this year and a bunch of the running backs. I know you've, had, you've rotated six receivers in the past. You could have played four wide, five wide if you wanted to, but is it a philosophy – of you and Ryan that we just we want to play that out there because of all the things you just said. I just think to run the ball, unless, you know, back when we had JT, you'd probably get a lot more 10 because we were, he was a running type quarterback, you know, or back when, you know, years ago when, you know, my Kustak at Northwestern or Coach Ed Tebow or those guys, you know, you had running guys and you could do the zone read or the quarterback run or the quarterback draw and, and all that, you know, because you, you know, I mean, you can leave the tailback on the linebacker and quarterback draw. Is not the same. CJ is a very adequate runner. He's also a great passer. Like you know, we don't want to overdo that. I mean, you know, he has been very, very capable of of pulling the ball and running. And we'll still have him as a running threat. But he's not our lead running threat. He's a, he's a great thrower. Um, 
We can easily throw the ball, but to me, when they know you're throwing, then your rush starts hurt because here comes, you know, the pocket just collapsing on you when you when you got the run game and you can play action and you can move the pocket and you know have the quick little play action passes or the shots off of that. There's a lot of good offense, so you know we're always going to be pretty good in the drop back game. We're always going to have it looks like because because Brian's going to continue to develop and recruit great receivers. But I think to be the offense we need to be, that line and tight ends make it off the chart good or make us talented, but maybe maybe have some hiccups along the way. Hi, Kevin. Um, Paris Johnson at left tackle, obviously a very talented guy. How close is he to becoming the player you want him to be? And maybe what, is, what does he need to improve on the most? I think just out there on that one-on-one, you know, island of pass blocking so much. He played a lot last year, but inside a guard, you know, you got a center help on half the protections that the center's working to you. Now you're out there against probably the premier, premier rusher of every team. I think I saw the other day, if I was can believe the NFL draft ec- experts, I think in the first round there's five – projected first round DNs that we played against. You know what I mean? And 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 so you know, that's you know, that's good on good good. And so he's now in a real matchup of a grown matchup that over time now but thankfully with the guys we got and the way Coach Johnson teaches it, he's gonna get a lot of phenomenal work from the one on one rush and every time we do team pass and team. So as we grow it's just getting him comfortable that one on one I can play against an elite player and yeah I'm an elite talent but I'm an elite player and I got that I got CJ's blind spot. So as we go, as he continues to grow and get more comfortable, that'll be a huge part of our offense being good, him being a quality, quality left tackle. And I'm going to ask about tight ends as well. Um, it seems like the numbers are good there now. Are, are you concerned at all, especially the state age where guys could transfer without, you know, setting out a year? Are you concerned you might lose a, a tight end in the transfer pool? Yeah, I mean, we're always concerned that with that with every position. That's a part of it right now. But at the same time, with this team has not been hit a lot because the development that Coach Mick and even the guys that left, the guys that have done the best have been the guys that stayed and gave themselves a chance to develop. And they developed here through Coach Mick and through practice and through the coaching that we have. So, you know, it, you know, it's going to be hard to keep everybody happy at every position. It's a challenge. But also, too, we're not just here to make guys happy. we got to develop and we got to win games. So there's a little bit of give and take. So they got to embrace the competition. they got to embrace the grind. they got to embrace the consistency. they got to embrace the muck and the dirty. And Because when you're playing O-line and tight end and running back and spring ball, and you do inside a day for 25 plays, that's grimy. That's dirty. You know, that's not what you see on college football at 9 o'clock when Herb Street fires it up now. Today was college football when you're a college player. And it was period four and it was inside. And let's go. And there's 22 people or there's – 18 people up there trying to wear out pads. We're wearing out shoulder pads. And who wants to play? Who wants to play? Get behind your pads and play football. And the guys that are going to be good, they're going to embrace that because those tight ends are going to be good. Have to embrace that wherever they're at to be a good tight end. They have to embrace the grind of what it takes to be that block guy. And then when you're in a place like this with Coach Day and the quarterbacks, we'll get you the ball if you command the ball. You embrace the grind. You command the ball. Your career will go your way. cockpit voice recorder of the Rose Bowl when C.J. and Jackson were having a field day. What would that sound like between you and Ryan of, let's go back to him, let's, I mean, what was the repartee there? Early when it wasn't going good, and I've been around some teams where we scored a lot of points, but we had a hard time maybe getting stops. I was like, just calm down. They, they're not, we can block them. And we can get open and just calm down. You know, just, just we got to score again. And let's just score again. And then as we were throwing it so well, it was fine a couple runs that we could go with that they didn't tee off on the rush, you know. And the way we had protected wasn't very well against our rivals. So to come back against, you know, that one defensive end was the Pac-12 D lineman of the year. So to come back and hold up and pass pro was key for that game. We're talking about how good his pairs can be. To hold up and pass pro one-on-one. A part of the keys for Jackson was pass pro was pretty good that day. It was really pretty good that day. And it was against one of the elite rushers, okay? But to, but to me, it was just like, you know, uh, I, I, didn't, you know I didn't realize they were down the corners they were. We actually went into the game thinking, okay, we're down a couple of our receivers. We're going to have to play an old slug flash game and keep it close. And all of a sudden, you fall down 14 or 17, like, okay, man, we got we to light it up. And all of a sudden, we just we got, we got hot as chicken grease here. We got rolling, you know. You know, and that's a credit to those guys. But credit to pass pro. I mean, Jackson made some plays, and the guy can put the ball on target, and he can see things, he can distribute it. But the the pro got going. And and the other, I think I think in a game like you know, I think we ended up with like what like 110 yards rushing. But I think if you count the running plays where we threw the RPO, 
we had 240 yards of offense. Because sometimes we're running, he was spinning an RPO out. So on the 31 rushes, we had 240 yards of rushing. It was seven point something to play every time we had a running play called. Because sometimes they're cheating the box, and he's got to distribute it a little bit, which he did. So, but my deal that game is let's just calm down, let's just keep playing. You know, uh, they ran like um, they ran uh, in the third quarter something that they did the Wisconsin Oregon game 45 38. They did like a thing on the you guys remember the jumbotron? I looked at the scoreboard. I said we're going to beat these guys 45 38. I go, come on, let's get a stop. Let's get a stop. We're going to be at 45 38, so that's close. What else? We good? I'm going to get in trouble if I keep this going. I, I, I'll, just one or two more. Coach, front row right to Tim Mack. As much as you talk about CJ and him being able to see the field and see who's open, see who's not, see whatever, the dime he dropped to uh, Jackson Smith and Jack before the go ahead touchdown is, I don't know, where does that rank in your, in your mind of passes you've seen thrown and, and what he brings to the table? Well, the really good ones can see it, and the really goods can anticipate, and then when they're great, they're accurate. And that's that was a that was pretty elite. No, that, was, that was accurate. That's also the receiver. Uh, he's got a lot of confidence. I think he knows. Sometimes, if you don't command the ball, I'll look at you a second. If I don't feel good, I'm going to the next guy. I think Jackson. Sometimes I'll keep hanging with you a second, man, because I know if I get it close, you got a way of getting open and making plays. So, but that was that was a, that was a great throw. He had a couple of those today, though. Yes, is CJ getting better right now what in practices? What, what are you noticing about him? Be a little bit louder, more command last year early. Just, you know, you kind of, you know, you got a lot going on now. He can still handle the thought process and everything that Coach Day and, and Coach Dennis wanted to do with reads and progressions and checks. He's more confident, which gives the line a lot more confidence with command presence and calling the plays and marking out cadence, calling for the ball, making IDs. It's just the more he plays, the more confident he is, the confident, more confident he is, the louder he is, the more assertive that is, and our players feed off of that. Because you can tell the voice, you know, command presence has been pretty good because now he's more – you know, he's, he's not that he's not thinking about the throw, but he's confident in the throw enough. He's not too – sometimes you're thinking so much that about that, you can't think about being loud on the snap count. There's a lot of thoughts going on. And when you're thinking a lot, you can't do your job. So the more he's doing it, the more comfortable he's getting. But I see him having better command presence. I see him being louder. After plays, he's more, you know, talking to guys about what he likes and sees. That's that's off the field. But during – while he's playing, he's more loud, he's more confident, he's more assertive, and he helps the line and the other players play off of that. It's like Paris. We're talking about his ability to be great one-on-one because those guys get matched up with really good players out there. And when you're playing again, to me, we're talking about the three positions, the quarterback and the two tackles. The, when those guys, those are the hardest jobs. That's one of the biggest mismatches on the field. That guy against him. And so as big as he is, as talented as he is, and same with Paris with the talent, their ability to handle one-on-one matchups, grown men on grown men one-on-one, and be dominant is a huge challenge. And the great players can do that. And the great quarterbacks have the ability to communicate, see, anticipate. And as a coach, the more we can make their jobs easier, the better you're going to be. When those tackles have easy jobs and those quarterbacks have easy jobs, and you can get your scheme, like I'm talking about Jim's scheme defensively, where they can show a lot of looks, but it's easy for them. Really good offenses show you things, but it's easy for us. Really good defenses show you things, but it's easy for them. The more we can make DeWan's job easy and let him, because he is a talent. Those are two talented, talented tackles. Now they need to become players. And players are consistent guys every day. And we play next year, the next year against those five top 15, 20 draft picks, which in the Big Ten we're going to get matched up against some great ones. They can hold their own every Saturday. And at the end, we can look back and say that was a talented offense because that line showed up and had those matchups every week. And that quarterback sitting in the pocket, he could pick them apart because collectively you got a unit. So DeWan and Paris both have to be great guys that are great one-on-one against some of the premier matchups. And the best thing is we get those matchups in practice. So we get exposed to that on a daily basis. Would you ever consider flip-flopping DeWan to the other side, or do you like Paris the left and DeWan at right? Because he was there, that's kind of where they think just be for Justin. He can get a handle that time if it needs to go that way. But right now, we kind of thought that, you know, would, 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 would be the way to go. My, you know, my, my thought even a year ago when they were playing guard was if you're in a right-handed stance, you're the next guy playing right tackle. So, you know, everything from moving this way now goes to go this way. Some guys are a little bit more comfortable, and sometimes it's the matchups. But one of the best guys ever, Coach Trent Williams, played right tackle in college. It's not like everybody's got to play left. So those are two great ones. We'll expect them both to get the job done. If we need a flip or 
there's a problem, we can move someone. And we got the young guys coming. If we need to, we'll probably get Donovan Jack Jackson if we need to attack as well. But we'll keep the, that position. It's not going to be a problem, but that position needs to keep coming along because that is a very challenged position in college football. And final question, Nathan Barrett, please talk about Matt Jones competed for a starting job in 2020. He was kind of your utility guy last year. What does he bring to this offense? He's doing awesome. He's in year five. I think you've got some recognition as an all-Big Ten player last year as the utility guy. So he's not been bad. He's a starter, and he actually is playing very good. He and Donovan, like I said, I think with Luke, we're going to be good inside. We get those tackles comfortable outside. That front five's got a chance to be really, really good, really, really good. But Matt Jones has had a tremendous winter, matured, in good health, in good spirits, in good condition. Uh, he has a chance to have a really good year. He's doing really well. Is it set between him and Right now we got Donovan at left and and uh, and Matt at right for now. Is there like a, a strategy behind why those guys fit there better? Um, I think we thought that if we needed Donovan at tackle, would we move DeWan to left, or would Donovan go to left? So we got him in that little left-hand stand, so we're there to get used to it. Coach, thank okay. you very much. Thanks. See y'all. Who's is this?